right? I believe I am streaming. No, I'm off. The internet can totally see me now, okay. Okay, except I can't see what I'm doing. Um, hi, YouTube, hopefully. I have never live streamed before, so fingers crossed this is working. If not, this is just gonna be a super ratchet live stream. Um, I didn't really have time to make a whole edited video this week and there were three different topics that I wanted to talk about and they're all sort of uh, timely. So I'm like, I'm just gonna, whatever, I'm just gonna live stream. So you're just gonna see me here with no makeup and a baseball cap on and like no production values, but we're gonna talk about stuff. All right, first thing I wanna talk about is uh, an article that I read by Margaret Wente. So for, uh, my Canadian peeps who, you know, read the Globe and Mail, then you know who Margaret Wente is, uh, tend not to agree with this woman on, sorry, this train going by. Uh, I tend not to agree with this woman on most things, like pretty much nothing. Anyway, um, earlier this week, she wrote an article in the Globe and Mail called, Why Are Some Gender Activists Denying Science? Okay, I don't know who these gender activists are, um, there probably are some because there were just, I feel like people in most groups or demographics who deny scientists, it, unless you're, unless the group is scientists. Um, but generally speaking, I don't personally know a lot of gender activists who deny science. I know a lot of them who are very pro-science. Anyway, rambling. Um, so her uh, hook, for this article is she is talking about um, specific families across Canada who are seeking to either change the gender marker on their birth certificate or their child's birth certificate because it doesn't accurately reflect their gender, it reflects the gender they were assigned at birth, and in some cases there are people who are advocating to just have the gender designation removed from the birth certificate completely because they uh, want to raise their children as gender neutral or they have children who themselves don't identify within the gender binary, meaning they don't identify as male or female. Um, and so she says at the end of the article that she doesn't have a problem with it, except then she spends the entire article before that talking about how she has a huge problem with this. Um, so this is what she says. This is part of what she says. The arguments for altering or scrapping gender identification are manifold. Biological sex is irrelevant, goes one. It's how you identify that counts. By not forcing people into his and hers, quotes hers, quotes Margaret Wente's, boxes goes another, another uh, argument. We will reduce stereotyping and advance equality. At the roots of these arguments is the belief that the very concept of a gender binary is false, harmful, and archaic. Okay, so I will say that I'm one of those people who believes that the concept of a gender binary is false. And by gender binary, I mean the idea that there are only two genders, that there are only, there's only male and there's female and nothing else. She goes on to say, the doctrine of non-binaryism holds that biological sex has nothing to do with gender, that gender exists along a continuum, and that the differences between the sexes are socially constructed. Babies are born as blank slates, and the extent to which they identify as male and female depends on their environment. Evolution plays an insignificant in any role in sex differences, and even the obvious differences in reproductive function are incidental to people's self-identity. Confusingly, transgender activists often argue that their gender identity is hardwired and that children who identify as the other sex were born that way. Again, quotes, Margaret Wentes. Okay, what? First of all, no. So Margaret Wente seems to be confusing the belief that there aren't only two genders with the belief that those two genders don't exist. And I have never heard anyone say that there's no such thing as boys, there's no such thing as girls, there's no such thing as men, there's no such thing as women. They simply acknowledge that there are genders beyond those two categories. Um, Again, I have never heard anyone, like certainly no one that I know, and I certainly do not hear people advocating en masse that 
babies are born as blank slates and that their gender or that their biology is irrelevant to who they are. Um, what I do hear a lot of people arguing is that not that biological sex has nothing to do with gender, but that biological sex and gender are not synonymous and that you cannot necessarily look at somebody's genitals or know what kind of genitals somebody has and then assume their gender identity. That's all it is. So anyway, she goes on and on and on in this vein that basically we're all being ridiculous and that we are denying science because science has shown that yes there are biological differences between different people um she goes the two biological sexes and there are only two are broadly though by no means perfectly uh coterminous with gender um okay broadly doesn't mean always and that's all that people are talking about yes if you take a large group of people oftentimes people with vulvas and uteruses do identify as girls and women people with penises and testicles often identify as boys and men but that does not apply to everyone and that has been true throughout human history and that is true across cultures and across geographical lines there have always been people who do not identify within one of those two categories mm -hmm. Lord. Um, this holds true for nearly every species in the animal kingdom. No, it doesn't. Read Evolution's Rainbow. It absolutely does not. Um, even us and for all societies on Earth. No, it doesn't. Like, at all. You see, there are people who do not identify within a binary in pretty much every society. That's just a thing. Um, Close to 100% of the human race is born with either a set of male or female chromosomes. But again, the fact that they're male or female is because we decided to name those set of chromosomes that way. We were the ones who decided that they were analogous to a person's gender identity, and they aren't always. Um, then she goes on to say, a small number of people are born with chromosomal and or reproductive abnormalities, Lord, she's calling them abnormalities. Um, and these people are commonly identified as, and again, in quotes, intersex. So again, don't put people's identity, like you can put intersex in quotes, but she never puts male or female in quotes. So I guess if you, you know, are male or female, according to her definition, you're a real person. And if you're intersex, you're make-believe, except you're not. Intersex people exist. There are all sorts of chromosomal variations amongst human beings. There are um, differences in external genitalia. There are differences in hormones. That is a thing. So again, you can't say on the one hand, oh, there are only two, there are only two biological sexes, and then be like, oh, well, by the way, footnote, no, there's not. Because there's not. Ah, oh, this woman drives me, ugh. Okay, she drives me up the wall. Many sex differences are biological and they matter. Sexual differenti differentiation is driven by sexual reproduction, which is the basic mechanism of animal evolution. It's the way that animals get together and pool their DNA. Anyone who claims that sex differentiation is a socially constructed myth or doesn't matter must have flunked Biology 101. Well, I claim that and I did not flunk biology. As current research shows, even our brains are different. Okay, okay, just stop. Yes, there is research that shows that there are differences in the brains of people who have, you know, double X chromosomes and ovaries and uteruses and vaginas. Um, you know, and then there are people who have different sets of genitalia and different sets of chromosomes and whatnot. But those differences are not consistent amongst every single individual person. It's more like, okay, if we take a large group of people with uteruses, uh, and we take a large group of people with penises and then we look at their brains, we are going to see that the people with uteruses have more in common in their brains and then the people with penises have certain characteristics in common. But that doesn't necessarily play out consistently in terms of how we experience gender because if it did, every single one of us with a uterus would be exactly the same. We would be exactly the same in terms of how we identify, 
we would be, you know, in terms of gender, we would be exactly the same in terms of how that gender manifested in behavior. Um, we would be exactly the same in terms of how that gen uh, how our gender manifested in terms of our personality, and we're not. So even though we've identified some differences, that doesn't mean that we understand how those differences affect us socially and in terms of our identity. Um, and there is, and I also want to point out that there is a difference between talking about these things and like, on like a macro level, when you're talking about an entire population and talking about individual people wanting to change their birth certificates. Like I said, at the end of the article, she goes on to say she has no problem with it. And like, well, then why are you writing this? Like, what difference does it make? Why do you need to know on an individual's piece of identification what kind of genitals they have? Like, I think about what you use a birth certificate for. Usually it's, you know, it's a form of ID you use to identify yourself so you can get other types of identification like a driver's license or a passport or what have you. Um, what difference does it make? Like, why do, why does, why does the Ministry of Transportation need to know whether or not I have a vulva or whether or not I have XY chromosomes or XX chromosomes or a different combination of chromosomes or whether I have, you know, more estrogen in my body or more testosterone in my body to give me a driver's license. Why does, ah, drain noise, um, you know, why does the passport office need to know that? Like nobody's going to check, nobody's going to test my chromosomes, so it, it doesn't matter. And I feel that she writes these sorts of articles under the guise of supporting science and wanting to, you know, promote factual information when really it's that she, for whatever reason, is bothered by the fact that we are now acknowledging, on like the most minimal level in our, in our society, that we are starting to acknowledge that you know, trans folks exist, that genderqueer people exist, that people who don't identify within the binary exist, that two-spirit people exist, and for whatever reason this really bothers her because it changes our social conventions on a really minimal level. Um, so anyway, I'm calling bullshit on Margaret Wente um, and this whole article. All right, so moving on to the next thing. Uh, Jay-Z released a new album, 444, I assume that's how you say it, um, and people are talking about it, you know, people are talking about the different tracks and how, you know, this album seems to confirm what, you know, most of us assumed after we heard Lemonade that he had cheated on Beyonce and people are like, whoa, what's up? Um, so I've been reading different think pieces about the album. Uh, you know, there are some people who feel like this is very calculating on their part and, you know, that they are, you know, they're sort of playing with the truth in order to, you know, put out these albums and create buzz for themselves. I have no idea. I don't, I don't know. I'm not in their family. Um, I'm obviously not in their relationship and I don't know them. That makes me sad. Not so much for Jay-Z. I don't, I don't actually really care about Jay-Z, like, at all. Um, but I, I believe I would enjoy knowing Beyonce quite a lot, but I don't. That makes me sad. Um, anyway, I just think that all this conversation that's happening around this album and Beyonce and Jay-Z is an amazing opportunity uh, for parents who may have kids who are fans of either Jay-Z or Beyonce or both who are interested in this album to talk about things like relationship boundaries, to talk about things like you know, whether or not, you know, there was actual cheating or whether or not there's some creative license being taken here, you know, for the sake of art, which artists do. So again, people who are flipping out about the fact that this may not be, you know, 100% autobiographical, it's fine. Like, that's what artists do. You can take creative license. But anyway, digressions. Um, you can talk to your kids about this, you know, just ask them, you know, what do they think? Like, what do they think that, you know, cheating is? What do they, do they think that, you know, a relationship, you know, can survive after cheating? Or I, I guess it can, because, you know, there are people who go on with their relationships after cheating, but, you know, how do they think that, you know, people move forward after cheating if they do choose to be in a relationship? Um, what do they think that they might do if they had a partner who was unfaithful, um, you can ask them, you know, how you 
talk about these things with your partners, how you figure out, you know, what your boundaries are and, you know, because what constitutes cheating is different for different people for in different relationships. Um, you know, these are all kinds of interesting conversations you can have with your kids, particularly if they're a little bit older. Um, I think it's really good for them to, to think about, you know, how might it feel to, to be unfaithful to someone? How might it make somebody else feel if they were unfaithful? Um, what are some reasons that they think that people might cheat, you know, might be dishonest? And are there other types of dishonesty, you know, aside from just cheating, aside from, you know, pursuing some kind of relationship with somebody else and, you know, being dishonest about it? Are there other types of dishonesty that are, you know, equally harmful in a relationship? Those are all great things to talk about. Um, in one of the articles I was reading, they were talking about, um, yeah, they were talking about, you know, the author was saying how they, he found it interesting that, you know, um, Jay-Z talks about how he has, how he fears what his children will think and the day that they find out, um, you know, that he's done some things that he's really not proud of. I think that's another really interesting, um, that's another really interesting subject to talk about with your kids. You know, just this idea that we might do things uh, at one point in our life that down the line we may feel ashamed or embarrassed about, um, that if we have kids, you know, how do we talk to them about those things? Um, it would be a great chance to talk to your kid and ask them how they would feel if they found out something about you um, that you were maybe not proud of. How would they want you to tell them? Uh, what might they think of you? You know, start, you know, asking them how a parent can establish boundaries for their child. Um, if they themselves have done something that they don't want their kid doing, you know, how do you talk about all of those things? I think that's a great thing to talk about to kids about. Um, so yeah, just a suggestion. Use uh, 444 as inspiration and a jumping off point for conversations with your kids. Okay, last thing. So I keep looking down because I'm looking on my phone here. I've got like an old SE. I'm not... Uh, I'm not current with my tech, it's okay. As you can tell from my like MacBook laptop, I'm low tech. Uh, okay, so last thing. Oh, I can't find the article about it. Anyway, uh, last thing I wanna talk about is super gonorrhea. So what is super gonorrhea? So super gonorrhea are um, strains of gonorrhea that are resistant to the uh, antibiotics that are typically or traditionally have been used to treat it. And um, these strains started to emerge, um, you know, they started to emerge in the last decade or so. And, you know, scientists, doctors were concerned. Uh, they began treating uh, these strains of gonorrhea with other um, alternative types of antibiotics. And for a while that what seemed to be working. But more recently, and I think it's like within the last year or so, um, there have been reported cases of gonorrhea that are resistant even to those new antibiotics. So I don't know if you call that super, super gonorrhea. I'm sorry because I don't have my article, but I will, uh, if anyone wants to know, I will find out if it has a different name. Um, anyway, that's, um, that's concerning. Antibiotic resistant infections and bacteria are, um, are worrisome. And, you know, gonorrhea, some, oftentimes it's asymptomatic, but it can have some unpleasant, some unpleasant symptoms. You know, you can have this like green and yellowy discharge and look so great, um, you know, just burning when you pee. Uh, it can lead, if the infection is left untreated, it can lead to fertility issues. Um, you can get an anal infection. You can even uh, get a throat infection from super gonorrhea. So anyway, um, I just wanted people to know that just because it's it's a bit concerning. Also, this is the reason that it's really, really important that if you are prescribed an antibiotic, uh, and not just for gonorrhea, for anything, if you are prescribed an antibiotic by your doctor to treat an infection, take the entire course of antibiotics. A lot of people start to take an antibiotic, feel better after a few days, and then don't finish their course of antibiotics. Finish your course of antibiotics because if you don't, that is how um, bacterial infections can develop a resistance. So that's my little PSA. Get an antibiotic, finish the antibiotic. 
Also, PSA number two, this is why it's not a good idea to, you know, pressure your doctor or medical practitioner into giving you antibiotics for things that cannot be treated with antibiotics, like viruses. And I talked all in my last video about um, HPV being a virus and why you can't treat it with antibiotics because antibiotics don't work on viruses. Um, and if they're just like antibiotics floating all around in our bodies and whatever, then our, then bacteria learn how to, you know, they, they um, I don't know, what's the word? They, they mutate um, and they develop resistance and then it's no good. So yeah, anyway, I'm gonna finish off this live stream now. Thank you for watching. Hopefully it did stream. Um, and if it didn't, I was just sitting here really just talking to myself, what? Uh, I will, I did, I will have a video next week. I filmed it a couple of days ago. I'm just not going to have time to uh, edit it and get it out this week. So I decided to do this instead. Um, so yeah, like a regular edited video uh, with production values coming next week. In the meantime, uh, let me sign off. I hope y'all have a great day and uh, I will see you soon. Okay, bye.